Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone who is in the parking lot or coming and watching online for our Wednesday evening worship service in the parking lot. And uh, I just wanted, to, as a way of announcement, uh, to make sure everyone realizes that next week we are not having the Wednesday night church service. I printed that in red ink on the song page. Uh, next week is Vacation Bible School, and so uh, I'll be busy, and we'll be busy from 6 to 8 every night next week, and uh, I'm really excited about it. You'll want to see inside the sanctuary. You'll probably want to click on on Sunday and see what's done in the upstairs, but the whole downstairs is transformed for our wilderness wandering journey and the escape from Egypt, uh, the story that we'll be focused on this year. Um, this is Father's Day weekend, and so we have some Father's Day type songs to enjoy singing, and that's where we'll begin today. We begin with faith of our Father. Children of the Heavenly Father. Yeah. 
And one more for Father's Day, thinking about our Father God as we've been singing these songs. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings, the music of the trees. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the fog of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, and the wanderers rock. This is my father's world, the birds that carol bring, the morning light, the lily white, he declares their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He comes in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me not forget that though the wrong seems up so strong, that it is a ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king, let the heaven ring. God reigns, let the earth be glad. Okay, then we're going to begin our service as we do each uh, Wednesday night and each devotion night with uh, the signing of the cross and together we say we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we're going to, for, uh, we'll have an opening confession today and then do the Apostles' Creed. Or no, then we'll do the Confession of Faith that's, that's printed on the uh, extra sheet I handed out for Father's Day, um, a responsive call to confession and absolution. From Romans 6. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. 
and together our confession, responsibly. You call us like Adam to be stewards of the earth, but we turn away and forget all that we have belongs to you, and so we waste your gift of precious resources. You call us like Noah to follow you without question, but we turn away and listen to the opinions of the people around us who care little about your will. You call us like Abram to leave our places of security and to trust in your promises, but we turn away and live lives that require little faith. You call us like Joseph to build relationships within our families through humility and forgiveness, but we turn away and hang on to our fears and our old hurts. You call us like Moses to see holy things in the midst of daily life and to listen to your voice and share your word but we turn away and hide behind our excuses and we fail to let your light shine. You call us like David and Jonathan to love one another and be open to how you are working in the life of another. But we turn away and oh, excuse me, we turn away and demand our rights and we cut ourselves off from each other and from you. You call us like Solomon to seek wisdom and impart it to our children. But we turn away and seek after vanity, things that truly do not satisfy. You call us like Joseph, to entrust our marriages and our children to you. But we turn away and consider our plans and our work as more important. You call us like Nicodemus, to be born anew by the breath of your spirit. But we turn away and hide in the darkness. You call us like Timothy, to remember the faith passed down to us by family and mentors. But we turn away and grow careless in our worship and personal devotion. Merciful Father, giver of life and new life, we acknowledge that without you our lives are broken. We remember that in baptism we were reconciled to you through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Restore and renew us through the power of your Spirit. Amen. And hear the word of forgiveness from Romans chapter 6. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Amen. And then our confession of faith. Tonight, not using the Apostles' Creed, but this confession based on Deuteronomy chapter 26. A wandering Aramean was our father. From his homeland, he journeyed to the land of promise, and then to the land of Egypt. There he became a great nation. The Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power with signs and wonders. He brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. In thanksgiving we return to the Lord, the first of all the fruit of the ground which he has given to us. We acknowledge that these gifts are for the work of the church, the care of the alien and the poor among us, and the mission God calls us to. Amen. And 
for our scripture today, I have a, a couple of sheets, a sheet front and back, in addition to the scripture page. Um, I'm going to replace the remainder of these uh, Wednesday services in the summer with the with the the scripture that I'm going to uh, only the second lesson, the scripture I'm teaching on. Um, at that particular Wednesday in our daily devotions that we do, one chapter of the Bible, Monday through Friday, uh, takes us through the um, uh, through the New Testament in a year. And so I'll replace either the second lesson or the gospel, depending on what our scripture is. I will refer to the gospel tonight, and so we'll have a little bit of that reading. Uh, but I'll, I'll focus some of my thoughts on the passage from Ephesians so that I don't have to do a worship service and go right upstairs and go teach for another 30 minutes or so. Um, I think that this is a wise use of, of my time and inviting people who normally see the devotion to join us for this worship time. Our first lesson. is from Isaiah 65. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who do, did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near to me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, as it written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, and from Judah, possessors of my mountain, my chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. Psalm number three is an individual lament, crying out in pain, confessing faith, crying out to God for help, and a final confession of faith. We read it responsibly. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept and I awoke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. We'll omit the reading of the second lesson. And we'll read the gospel at this time. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus and the disciples sailed to the country of the Gerizim, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. 
for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to not let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerizans asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had, had gone begged Jesus that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I'll get to today's devotional reading from uh, Ephesians chapter 6 in a little bit. I first wanted to point out uh, I'll have a few more comments on Sunday, um, but but uh, since I'm going to be teaching on Ephesians 6, I'll leave some of those out. But our gospel reading today is only one of many, many stories in Luke chapter 8. And next week, we'll be in Luke chapter 9. They aren't going to do any of the other stories in Luke chapter 8 in our assigned readings for the year. Four in particular are connected to this story in a powerful way. Uh, they, the, these four stories together reveal the scope of Jesus' authority and power. And so I really wanted not to speak just about the demon-possessed man, but all four stories. The first story, the one immediately preceding these verses, in verses 22 to 25, is the story that you, you heard in our story, how the disciples were crossing the lake, uh, the, the Sea of Galilee. Well, it was during that crossing that we had the story of the horrible storm that arose on the lake. And the disciples afraid for their lives and Jesus asleep in the stern of the boat. And Jesus gets up and speaks to the wind and the waves to be peace, be still. And there becomes a great peace and a great calm. And the disciples wonder, who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. It's a story that shows Jesus' power over nature. And we know that nature is much more powerful than we. Anyone who sees on the last days the floods in Yellowstone Park, the destruction of roads and bridges, uh, anyone who's seen the damage of a hurricane or a tornado or the strike of lightning in your own trees and going underground and knocking stuff out, electronics in your house, um, the storm, nature, uh, well, we never want to make Mother Nature angry, right? Uh, nature is so powerful and so fickle and is a violent threat to our lives. But Jesus has power over nature. And then we have our story today, the, the story of this man who had a legion, hundreds of demons inside of him. And they are afraid of Jesus and they are begging him. They know who he is, the Son of the Most High God. 
and they are afraid of his power, and they beg him not to send them into the abyss. So he sends them into the pages and they drown. Uh, and, and this man whom no one could bind, no one could jail, a man tormented, living naked among the tombs. When the townspeople came, what did it say? They found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, just like the story of Mary and Martha. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They'd been afraid of the man and the demons within the man. And whoever has this power over all those demons, well, they're afraid of him. They ask him to leave, and he does. But not before commissioning the man, the formerly demon-possessed man, to go out and be the evangelist, the first evangelist to the Gentiles. Paul would follow, so would Philip, so would Peter, but these, uh, this man is the first of the evangelist to the Gentile nation, to the region of the Decapolis. And then um, in the story immediately following today, and so I, I don't know, I, I think we all experience this, that we, we know about the power of nature, but we know also about the power of things that control us. They can, they can be emotional troubles, they can be habits or addiction that seem to be beyond our power. And they may be. They may be signs of the what, what Paul calls tonight in Ephesians 6. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the ruler of, the, of darkness. Well, Jesus has power over nature. He has power over all the things that bind us and all the power of the enemy. And the enemy is afraid of Jesus. Then we have two more stories that continue this chapter. There is in the story that follows this, the woman who's been 12 years with an illness. And she thinks if I just touch Jesus' the fringe of his garment, I'll be healed. And she is. She does touch it, and she is healed. Jesus senses the power leaving him, for him, and he stops and asks, who touched me? And she told him it was her and what had been going on. And he said to the woman, go in faith. You, you can take these stories home and read them all, but, but daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace power over every sickness. We see that repeatedly within the scripture. Everyone who comes to Jesus for healing is healed. He has power over nature, power over the realm of darkness and demons, and power over sickness. And finally in this chapter, he has power over death. Because when that woman touched him, he'd been on the way to Jairus' home for his daughter was very ill, and after the woman touched him, as they were journeying toward the home, people came saying, don't trouble the teacher any longer, for she has died. Jesus, in effect, says, pay no attention to them, come with me. And he goes to the house, and he tells the people, this girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laugh at him, because they know when someone's died. But Jesus takes the man and the woman, and Peter, James, and John into the room. And he says to the girl, Child, arise. And her spirit returned. And she got up at once. Power over death, even. The ultimate enemy. I, I didn't want to just focus on the, the one story because they, they really belong together. Power over nature, power over the things that bind us, power over our sickness, all sin, power over death. There's an early Christian creed that helps us understand 
what these, the, the expanse of his power and who Jesus is. That earliest Christian creed was the phrase, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over all. In Philippians chapter 2, after he ascends again into heaven at the right hand of God, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Matthew 28, as he sends the disciples out, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go, make disciples. In Luke chapter 7, just the chapter before our chapter that we have today, we have Jesus' encounter with the faith of the centurion who recognizes in Jesus that ultimate authority. And Jesus said of him, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Galilee, excuse me, in all of, in, in all of Israel. That this centurion understood that Jesus was under the authority of Almighty God. And he spoke for God. And when he spoke for God, whatever he said had to be obeyed. And so he said, Jesus, don't, don't come to my house. I'm not worthy. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said of him, I've, I've not seen such great faith in all of Israel. Go, your servant is healed. The power of Jesus, because he is in authority over everything. Jesus is Lord. The Greek word is kyrios. It literally means, or properly is used, of a person exercising absolute ownership rights. We are called servants of Christ for a reason. Because he is Lord. And he exercises absolute ownership rights over everything in the world including us. He has authority over nature, over powers that bind us, spiritual forces of evil, over illness, over death. He is the authority. There's no one above him. Jesus is Lord of all. So that leads me to a few questions for tonight. And then we'll look briefly at, at Ephesians 6. What is the struggle or challenge that you're carrying with you today? What does it mean for Jesus to be Lord of all? What is Jesus able to do for you today? For that struggle or that challenge that you carry with you. If he is Lord of all. Is he powerless? What is Jesus wanting to do for you today? And what is Jesus, if he is Lord, calling you to do? What do you need to relinquish to his control? These are powerful questions. I invite you to consider them. And for our devotion tonight on, on uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we've been in the, the wonderful book of Ephesians for five previous days. The theme is a call to Christian unity in Christ, who saved us by grace through faith for a life of works that bring glory to God. He's done this so that we could grow in maturity and together become like Christ, built up in His love. In the verses we, we looked at yesterday, a life that is filled with the Spirit has four characteristics. We sing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We, we sing together. We make melody in our hearts to the Lord. In our own hearts, we sing individually. We sing to the Lord together. We sing in the car or in the shower. We, we sing our praise to God. We give thanks in all circumstances. The third thing. In every circumstance. I, I was reminded of that today when I was struggling through trying to find something. And I was having such trouble. I remembered last night's teaching. 
to give thanks and I stopped and I gave thanks for the struggle I was having because God must have meant it to be there for me and what I could learn out of it and, and rely on him for help. So we sing together, we sing on our own, we give thanks in all circumstances and we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We, we treat ourselves as a servant to each other which is exactly what Jesus said to the disciples so many times when they were trying to wonder which of them was the greatest and he said no the greatest shall be servant of all this is the word of Jesus and Paul reminds us of that here in Ephesians that we are called to submit to one another everyone submit to their brother or sister in Christ in as you would to the Lord out of reverence for the Lord who is in your brother or sister serve them as you would Christ. That's the fourth thing. But to be clear about that fourth thing, he gives us several illustrations. Last night, at the end of chapter 5, it was about husbands and wives. Today, it's children and fathers, and masters and servants. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live in, long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants and, and masters is now the, the third example of what it means to submit to one another. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters. You have this passage uh, on one side of a sheet that you have. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Uh, this is great advice for a worker doing any work in any job. We don't serve the boss. We serve Jesus Christ. And as a Christian, that's our guiding principle. And to bosses or to masters, do the same to them. And stop your threatening, knowing that he is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. We may on earth see masters and servants. God doesn't. We are all his servants. And there is no partiality with him. So watch how you treat those who are under you, because you are under Christ. Now at the end of chapter 6, Paul turns to the third major word of the book of Ephesians. The first word was sit. We are seated in Christ. The second word that began in chapter 4, verse 1, was walk, live according to your, your um, position of sitting in Christ Jesus. And now stand. You're going to find the words stand against, withstand, stand firm, and stand within our reading. In battle, we are not out attacking we are standing in defense. And then we have one weapon to fight with. Well, two. Finally, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness to give given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances take up the shield of faith 
with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of the of the, the salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god so the the one offensive weapon is the sword which is the word of god but then we're to be doing something not just standing fighting against Satan. we take the word and verse 18 we are praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is in prison. The year is A.D. 62, and he's in prison in Rome. And he's writing these, this magnificent letter of Ephesians. And he's asking the people to pray for him as they pray for one another, that God may give him the words to open his mouth boldly, even while he's in prison, to preach the gospel to everyone he sees, the soldiers guarding him, uh, Caesar, whom he must stand before, to preach the gospel like he's preached it to everyone he stood before. While he's in prison. What a prayer. And final greeting, verse 21, and, and benediction. So that you also may know how I am doing and what I am doing, Titius, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your heart. Obviously, he's taking the letter of, 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 to the Ephesians, to the city of Ephesus. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith, from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus, with love incorruptible. At this time, we'll have our offering prayer, and then we'll have our uh, our prayers of the church. In our confession of faith earlier, Lord, we spoke about the first fruits. That when Moses said they came to the land, they would present their first fruits to the Lord as a way of thanksgiving and as an investment in the in the the work of of God, Lord. Use these gifts, our first fruits, as our thanksgiving to you, as a symbol of our trust in you, and as our prayer that you would use these gifts for the proclamation of the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord over all the enemies of human beings, and that he comes to set us free by faith in him. Amen. And then to the prayers, we begin with the responsive prayer printed in the bulletin. Show us your mercy, O God, and grant us your salvation. Give us the joy of your saving help again, and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Give peace in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Keep the nations under your care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon the earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Lord, we pray for Mark, for your healing, as we remember the woman who was healed. We reach out to touch you. And we pray, Lord, for your healing to be with Mark and Dave, Stan and Peggy, Kathy and Lucinda, Billy, and tonight from her surgery, Katie, and her father, Tom, in the hospital, for Joshua, who's, who needs your special healing. We pray for Terry and Katie, George Ann and Bruce and Joyce, Elaine, Ron, Tom, Zach, Brittany, Susan, Robin, and Tyler. We join Amy and Paula in giving thanks to you for your healing power. 
We pray, Lord, your grace to be with Tom and Chris on the death of her mother, Dorothy, and her, her funeral service yesterday. And our prayers conclude. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit, a staining with your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come before you. A communion liturgy. Father, we recall the gift of your Son who came to us as one of us to lead us back to you through his life, teaching, power, death, and resurrection. We remember the night he was betrayed, his words from the cross, and his death for all who have sinned. And so, Father, we bring you these gifts of bread and wine. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And together we pray the Lord's Prayer as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, as Mark brings communion elements around, please hold on to the kit and wait till I instruct us to take it together. But we have a communion song to sing while it's being passed out. I invite you to remove the wafer from the top cellophane cover 